This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blayton. And this week, we're happy to have our guest, Thomas DeNewville, creator of I Care If You Listen and I Care If You Listen magazine, which is brand new. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Um, but Thomas, thanks for being on the show. I feel like this is a, a meeting of new music. It is. It is. It's like, it's like the Fellowship of the Ring of new music or something. Right. right. I, I've, I've often thought of our project, Sound Notion, and uh, I Care If You Listen, as being somewhat related because we're on the same topic, obviously, but we also were started at almost the exact same time. It's you true. You started your blog the same month, December 2010, that we made our kind of pilot beta episode of Sound Notion back when the four of us were all students at Michigan State. Um, so we've been reading your blog for, for many years and it's great to, to finally have you on the show. We're, I, I think of you as kind of, especially now with the magazine, this kind of journo mogul of, of, of new music, <laughs> right? Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. You're going to take that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for so, having me. Very excited to, to meet you guys in video and, and talk about this today. So tell us about how, uh, I care if you listen, got started. I, I remember when I first started reading it, it was at like something like thomasdeneuville.com slash blog or something, or slash I care if you listen or something. Correct. Uh, it started as just a way for me to document the work on my thesis, on my master's thesis, um, you know, mostly for my mom. And uh, when I was, when <laughs> That's I was why we with, do the show. Yeah, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> we all know that. Um, so when I, was, when I was done with my thesis, I... I realized that I had this platform that was ready, and um, I, I might as well continue publishing some content. And at the same, at the time, I was also the French correspondent for this um, classical music website called ClassicInfo.com, uh, which covers classical music in French. And uh, so I was writing from from New York for them. So I was kind of used of you know the idea of getting comps and going to concerts, reviewing and the deadline and the format. So I decided to do this in English too. And um, I started reviewing CDs and concerts, and then somebody right out of the you know right out of the blue, somebody wrote to me and said, "Hey, can I write for you?" And I said, "Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'll get you a press comp. No, no problem. You want you want CDs? What do you want?" So we started working together, and more people came. I reached out to more people, and quickly a small community started to to gather, you know, around this idea. And uh, I felt less and less comfortable having this on my own server, especially with a title like "I Care If You Listen." It was it was like too Thomas centric. So I moved, I moved it away, and I, I bought a .com, I reinstalled the WordPress from scratch, uh, I changed the theme and everything, I mean, I've, I've been tweaking the theme for two years, but uh, so this is how we basically found ourselves from moving from my website to, to a real .com and developing social media, et cetera, et cetera, and le letting the team grow that away from my own website and away from my own music and my own activity. I, it, was, it was really not about me, really, so that, that's how it happened. So, so tell us a little bit about how the, the title of your blog came about, because that to me is one of the more striking features of it, and, and it's, it's always something that I was a little uncomfortable with, to be honest with you, uh, in reference to the, the editor's title that they slapped onto Milton Babbitt's uh, article. Obviously, everyone is probably watching the show is familiar with Babbitt's uh, The Composer is Specialist, which the High Fidelity articles retitled, Who Cares If You Listen?, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship to, to that and how that became the title of your, your blog and now magazine? Well, I remember being an undergrad and you know, sitting in music, in music history and reading this article as part of the class. And I was, I was really shocked. I was really shocked, of course, by uh, you know, what the editor did to this title and kind of twisting the meaning and twisting the idea behind the article, of course, but also uh, the very strong statement that, that David was, was taking in this article. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's a little bit like fashion in a way. Um, what we see uh, on, on fashion shows uh, can, can seem ridiculous at times or just like, you know, out of this world, but um, it's basically research. And it's, uh, the, in terms of style, this is what we're going to see in stores maybe two years or three years down the road once, uh, you know, the, 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 the ideas have sipped in and people are trying to get inspired by these kind of things. So I think that Milton Babbitt was saying this, the same kind of things, you know, like he's doing research and as a researcher, He's not that much interested in an audience, you know. He's, he has to do his work as a researcher. So anyway, but I was still, I was still kind of shocked by this statement. And um, and when I decided to put my ideas on, on the blog, I, I, at the time hosted on my website, 
I felt like you know it was it was it was kind of a positive statement. It was not uh, directed to, directly at uh, Milton Babbitt, of course, uh, but it was just turning this uh, into a positive statement. And I think that as a community, as individuals, and as a community, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to listen what we're uh, what we're saying, what we're creating as musicians, composers, performers. So I don't know. I was I felt I felt good about this and. Um, I just gave it this name. Uh, of course, later on, when the team joined, uh, I was not comfortable, you know, having this on my website, so we moved. But that's another that's another story. But that's basically the idea. I was shocked mm. as an undergrad, but uh, I thought that flipping it made such a strong, positive statement. And um, and also, I mean, it, it it's kind of difficult, even in terms of SEO, not to have the word music in the title of the blog or the magazine. But uh, on the merch that I print and that I give out to people sell. Uh, since there is no mention of the world music, some people feel very, can really relate to this statement. I mean, my wife walks around with a tote bag that says, I care if you listen. And people just stop her on the street and say, yeah, I do care if you listen. And do you care if I listen? You know, so <laughs> I, think, I think it's funny. Most of the time it's hobos, but that's fine. That's all you okay. It could be about the NSA. <laughs> it could be about the NSA. When oh, they God. stop her, are they like, do you know Thomas Newville? Oh, my God. Oh, they, no, actually, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would say that. You're very kind. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> do you, we should get so we should get some Sound Notion tote bags. I think. Do you That's have? Uh, do you ever have a, a, a conver- you ever have a dialogue with people about that title before? Is that something that you've you've discussed with a lot of people in the past? Not really. I mean, I think that people who who have studied music get it right away. Uh, people who don't find it very positive and and you know react very positively to it. Uh, but I've never really had a conversation about it. You know, and the only thing was maybe where did the idea come from? I mentioned the article and that's pretty much the end of the conversation. Right. Well, I think the sentiment is nice because, you know, we are, we, we are a community and we at new music concerts, you'll often see a lot of the same, the same people. You know, it's it's very, I don't want to say incestuous, but it's kind of incestuous. But um, Insular. I mean, it's insular, yeah, there you go. But I, I believe it's a very nice sentiment. I think it's also, you know, People who are not into classical music or contemporary classical music, this is the kind of vibe that they get, that it's a, it's a closed circle, it's a club that they don't really belong to, and, and, and I feel that a welcoming statement is also a way to break down the barrier, at least at a, you know, even at a very superficial level. But you know, telling people, you know, this is not what you think, it's probably more accessible than you think, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to come with an attitude, and, and, you know, and that's the statement. Now let's talk and let's exchange some ideas. Well, and, and in that regard, I think that what you do at I Care If You Listen, what we're doing here at Sound Notion, what you know Christian Carey is doing at Sequenza Twenty One, and what everyone uh, at at New Music Box is doing, is in some ways uh, a- education, right? Out- outreach and education, and I think that's uh, one of the the really valuable uh, things that that comes from the way that you're you're blog is written your site is written in a very friendly conversational way uh and i think uh that brings in a lot of new people have you gotten any feedback from from people outside of our our insular community about the things that you're doing yeah yeah absolutely um i think people connect very easily with a with a mixtape a mixtape is a, a way to kind of lure them in uh, so by, by picking music that, in, that is not necessarily contemporary classical music, but having some pop, some folk, some, some rock or electronica, but still in the same zeitgeist, um, and just, you know, dropping in some Missy Mazzoli or David T. Little, you know, these kind of guys, people realize that the bridge is not that hard to, to cross, basically. You know, it's not, it's not that far. If you're listening to music written by people who live in your city, in your country, you know, have pretty much the same age or something, you can really relate to their language easily, I think. So, uh, so, so that's that's a great way to get people in. Then, in terms of language, uh, I was very adamant since the very beginning about covering music that can be complex, but not in a complex way. Uh, I, I would love to be able to talk about contemporary music using rock journalism language, uh, because that's the way people, you know, that's the way people interact. That's that's the kind of language that people read on other blogs or other news outlets and it doesn't have, you know, the music can seem complex enough. It doesn't have to be complex in the way we talk about them. So, uh, so this is actually part of the guidelines that I give to the, to the writers and, you know, uh, 
make sure that they realize that this is not an academic paper. It won't necessarily be read by people who know 100% what they're talking about. So let's not talk about Shankarian analysis or you know, set theory. Uh, <laughs> that's not the place. For that. That's really not the place for that. Yeah, we, in, in as much as we have editorial meetings at Sound Notion, that's something that we that comes up a lot for us as well. Is that um, we we don't want to alienate people that don't have a degree in music, you know, and and haven't taken a Shankarian analysis class. It comes up a lot, especially when we talk with uh, electronic musicians and, and electronic music to you know like. We want to talk about the 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 music. We don't want to talk about granular synthesis on 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 the show. So that's it's really I'm I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, we we have that same uh, discussion all the time and it and it can be difficult how to discuss complex music in a way that's not complex. Do you have any strategies for for how you've accomplished that in the past? Um, I think that uh, I try to stress the fact that an article should say something and um, have a sense of narrative, uh, give some important elements from the very beginning. So that's that's straight up, you know, straight up the, the, the editorial guidelines. Um, so you're how, talking opinionated writing? Not necessarily. Even even a concert review or a city review. Uh, you know, should say something. What's your largest point? You know, are you where are you going with this? Uh, you know, a risk that there is, for instance, with concert or CD reviews is is a blow by blow kind of kind of review. Right. He did that? The guy did that? Then the piece did that? And what? That's not the point. You know, let's try to to step back, look at the piece. Leave that uh, for the New York Times. Sorry, what? Oh. Nothing. I was just ripping on the New York Times. <laughs> oh. No, but I mean, you know, that's that's what. If people come to your website to get some news, that's what they want, you know. If they, if you're giving them the liner notes or the or the track list, that's that's not interesting for them. So as a writer, you're supposed to digest whatever you've seen or heard, find a perspective, and propose that perspective in a very simple language, in a very plain language. So so that that's that's the way I think we we can do it. But you know, the the problem we're talking about also about complex music and talking, you know, between music majors. It's a natural tendency. It's just polarization. You know, you put people that share the same interests together, and you know they're gonna start to get very excited and talk about more and more geek, geeky stuff. You know, more and more complex stuff. Right. So I think that's also why uh, I'm I'm trying to do something more interdisciplinary, and that's something that was on the back burner for a, for a year or two almost. But I'm, but I'm going to bring this back pretty soon. So I want to be able to talk about contemporary art. I want to be able to talk about architecture, maybe design. We talk about technology. Uh, there is a technology editor that works with us, uh, Dana Wen, who's based in Seattle, and she does an incredible job. I don't know if you guys have read the article in the magazine about the iPad apps and the page turning apps. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. but that's, I think, by, by bringing other elements and trying to make larger connections between classical music, contemporary art, design, technology, then we can step out of this polarized conversation between music majors. Which is, you know, interesting for music majors. But if we try to reach out a larger community, we have to step out of this pattern. Yeah, it always strikes me that's uh, a huge problem with uh, music is that everyone loves music and everyone feels a strong connection to music, but <laughs> the music specialists have the most alienating way of talking about music. But music is also the most universally appreciated in the general population. Um, that always strikes me as a big disconnect. Um, also, you're talking about the, the approach in the magazine to uh, using, like what you said, like uh, like rock and roll language or pop music uh, language to, dis just to talk about the music. Um, do you think that had anything to do with, uh, I care if you listen, getting picked up as a magazine for uh, distribution uh, through uh, iTunes? No, 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 I think that's something that I tried to establish very early on the blog. Um, just you know, to differentiate ourselves, but also because I think it's it's fun as a writer to write about a contemporary music concert as you would about a rock concert, and mm -hmm. um, I think you can you can say very serious things not necessarily in a serious way, and um, so that's something that we try to achieve even on the blog. So it, it we're trying to to um, bring this to the magazine, but that's something we try to do very early in the blog. I think some concerts, perhaps, if you're reviewing or talking about music in general, they, there is a certain amount of technicality 
that is needed to describe some pieces. Um, whether it's, uh, I don't know, whether, if you really want to talk about a, a Webern piece, I mean, I, it, that must be a really difficult task to put that in rock language. Well, technically, we don't talk about Webern pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but I see We're talking about new music here. Yeah, new oh, music. right, right, right. Uh, no, no, I see your point, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, the idea is to stay very down-to-earth and simple and straightforward up to a certain extent. You know, if you're talking about, I don't know, microtonal music and people have no idea what it is, or you're going to have to step into technical terms, you know. Right. In each, in each article, you'd have to it, speak about it as if you're presenting it as a new thing. Like, oh, this is how this works, by the way. So, yes. I mean, I can find that to, uh, that sounds like it might be a little bit difficult. Yeah, it would be difficult and tedious for people in the long run. I think we can assume that people, you know, kind of follow us. So we don't necessarily have to go back from scratch and talk about, you know, basic concepts every single time. But, um, and once again, the, this idea of, of speaking in a very plain language, I think it's more of an, of an average desire than a piece by piece desire. So some pieces on the blog are more complex than they should be. Some pieces are maybe a little bit too simple than they should be. But overall, if you were to sum up all the pieces on the blog, I think that's the tone that I'm trying to achieve. The thing that actually gets in my grill more than uh, complex language talking about music is exalted language. Um, some writers seem to go out of their way to talk about uh, the transcendent quality of something, you know, and... I don't think that there's a lot of there's a lot of value in trying to you know people find music transcendent or not, but there's not a lot of value in trying to make sure they understand this is art music and it is it creates a transcendent experience, and they spend too much time trying to make sure you understand that <laughs> rather than just uh, I don't know, like you said uh, trying to engage the audience in some specific way that gives them a feel of what the piece was like without giving them a blow by blow uh, rendition. Um, yeah. no, go ahead. No, I think, you know, it's, it's great to feel so strongly about a piece of music, but uh, I'm sure there is, there's always a way to suggest people why and how this could change their life or present elements that they can themselves integrate and, uh, analyze in their own terms and see how it's relevant to them. Instead of just saying, this is classical music. This is, you know, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing more complex than that. Well, maybe you can just break it down and let them decide, you know. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I think that's the way to go. <laughs> um, it also seems like if you're going to do that kind of thing, um, that it kind of, you have to, you, it has to, the, the fulcrum upon which that st kind of approach breaks is the personality of the writer. Um, in the same way that I think this show, we express our opinions, but what makes it engaging, hopefully, is that everybody has their own personality. I'm the, the guy who hates everything, and Dave <laughs> is the egghead who knows everything, and Patrick is, you know, the the uh, the guy from the city. The wonk. <laughs> the wonk. The wonk. And, and Nate is the, the techno nerd. And and I don't mean mm -ts, mm -ts, techno, I mean, you know. I, I, I feel sometimes. like you're you're presenting us as a sitcom. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but the, if people four find guys show, talk about new music, what's going to happen find next? Show engaging. It's not. You can't say it's just because they presented X, Y, and Z facts about you know the news and you know, what happened in new music. It has to do with how those facts break across our personality and our group dynamic. And uh, I guess what I'm getting at is that you you have to vet the right kind of writer. For your, for I care if you listen to make sure you're getting what you need in that way. That's absolutely true, um, and this is also why I really wanted to reach a critical mass of writers as soon as possible, because I think by reaching a certain amount of writers, then you can have a very varied um, spectrum of taste and ideas and ways to explain those ideas. Uh, and that's why I didn't want this to be just 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 me. You know, I just wanted to open this up as much as possible. If it were only me, it would just be my own taste, my own agenda, and my own limitations. You know, I, I, I don't know everything there, there is to know about, about contemporary classical music. So by opening up and bringing people from different backgrounds, different profiles, electronic music, um, you know, spectral music, more and more conservative music, 
performers. Um, I've got people who come from from the opera and from uh, uh, opera staging, for instance. So by by multiplying the amount of perspectives on contemporary music, I think we can reach an average uh, that 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 will that will speak to people. And you know, if if one article is too obscure for you, maybe another one by another writer will give you. Um, more information or will bring information in a way that speaks more to you. So, so the, the way to achieve that is basically what you guys do with four different profiles, but I try to do it with many, many more different writers and cover many, many more, you know, like a, a larger ground than I would personally. Right. So what has the response been from your subjects, the musicians that you are, are, are writing about? Have they seen a, a lot of value in, in being, having their stuff featured on I care if you listen. Overall, it's very positive. I think people enjoy the experience. Uh, it's it's good exposure. Right now, I'm just starting to set up some some metrics in place and see how this impacts, you know, maybe traffic on their website uh, for people that I featured on the on the the, the mixtape. How it impacts their sales, uh, just to see, you know, how we can improve the, the the situation and help people out. But overall, people are, you know, I, I pretty much had like 99% of positive feedback. I had a couple right. of comments that were, you know, negative. It's, all, it's always talking. that 1% that's just like, oh my Yeah, God. that's fine. No, that's fine. <laughs> it would joking. be worse if, if it were just 100% that, you know, we would be doing something wrong. So I'm glad to get this 1% of people that are like, you know, this is not good. You shouldn't do this this way. So it, it's great. You know, it, it keeps us thinking about what we're doing. But overall, the feedback has been very positive and, um, I don't know, we're just very passionate about, about what we're doing and we're trying to be as diverse as possible. We're trying not to cover only people in their mid-20s. Uh, you know, and that's, that's something that I'm, that I'm going to try to also implement and, and monitor strongly on the magazine. Um, you know, the 40 under 40, that's something that I just cannot adhere to. Um, yeah. There are people that are way beyond their 40s and they are still extremely influential and we can learn a lot from them. They are doing some wonderful things. So I'm also not trying to fall in, into the, the the age bias that would be very easy talking about new music right. Yeah, that's um, that's something actually that uh, we actually had a comment in our in our chat room about uh, how the web is really useful of keeping uh, abreast of all of these different trend, all these different people that are making all kinds of new music at in, in places that are far removed from our usual social circles and and you know you, you talk about being a young person the tendency is to con cover people that are like you to cover young people and, and for you young people in new york city um and and it that's something that is i think of of real value not just to our audience but also to us you know as as the people uh who are looking for this stuff to find i i'm curious about your experience trying to cover a a field where we define it relatively narrowly, right? We were just joking earlier that Webern is outside of this this relatively small set of music that we're interested in for for I care if you listen or for Sound Notion or for New Music Box. However, um, there's still a lot of diversity in it, and there's there are people that are in their 20s and 30s that are making this stuff. There are people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, and you know people that are over 100 years old that are that are writing really compelling new music. Um, and and there are people in New York, and it's very easy to cover them because there's a lot of traditional media that's based in New York. But uh, I wonder what your experience is like trying to reach that that vast. Uh, subject area? Um, well, I think it starts by being aware that this can turn into a very New York-centric kind of thing. So um, just by being aware of this, we can, we can reach out and look for other things somewhere else. The, I'm, I'm lucky by having um, a team of about 50, 55 contributors, present and past, on, on the website that are based in six different countries. So. By having, I wouldn't say a foot, but maybe a toe, you know, in different countries, um, people people keep track of the person, what's going on in their in their area, and they just send back information to us. Uh, also, it's very easy to get in touch with us. If you just go to the website, you can fill a form and you know just reach out to us, reach out to us on Twitter. 
So just by monitoring the conversation, being very open and listening to what people are saying, we get ideas for, from all over the world and you know, from very, very different places. So that helps us not being New York centric or US centric or age centric. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that. That's basically that's basically what I had to say. Just being aware that that this is a risk, and just and just and just pushing the envelope and reaching out. Also, the the the, um, the contributors themselves just bring things to me, and they're like, "Hey, this should be on the blog." And I'm like, "Well, let me think about it." You know, talking about maybe film music. Is film music new music? You know, um, improvised music. Um, some some very very avant garde electronic music. So it's just. The, the contributors themselves are pushing the envelope, and by having a large group of contributors with very, very different interests, they are themselves um, defining the, the 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 breadth of of music that we're covering. So my my role, I think, is just to monitor this and make sure that we don't go too much one way or another. But uh, but it's it's a very dynamic relationship that I have with the with the contributors, and people bring new stuff and say, hey, what about this? What about that? We can talk about it. We can have a conversation, but that's also what redefines constantly the the the, the what is new music on iCurious to listen. Yeah, I mean that's something that we we deal with a, a, a lot, and uh, it's it's hard. And it sounds like you also have a problem based on what you were just saying of trying to stay focused and 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 maintain a uh, direction to your to your overall publication and not just let everything go on there and it becomes like you know a tumblr feed or something absolutely that's that that's really an issue and it's it's always tempting when somebody reach out reaches out to you and say hey you know i'm putting this record out and it's great and you just listen to it and you're like i'm just on on, on the border like if i if i start covering this i'm opening a door to another world another you know and i, I don't necessarily have resources to cover this um, in a satisfying way, so should I go this way? Is it too early? Is it too late? Like, but I, but I assume you have the same the same kind of issue, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, one of the one of the very first mm -hmm. comp CDs that we got was the, like this cello and piano thing, and it was just like kind of doofusy Me. pop music for cello and piano, uh, and it it, I mean, it was perfectly well constructed for what it was, but it was not the sort of thing that we wanted to do, and we we had a few conversations about whether we wanted to cover it and we ended up not and we still get things like that and especially people filling out the web form and saying hey you should you should cover this thing because you know everybody wants attention for their thing but a lot of it is a, a little bit like you said just a little bit outside of 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 the thing that we're interested in and if and it like you said it's it opens the door to us ending up covering you know like all of folk pop music or something uh which is not what we're interested in doing or yeah, I at think, least not oh, on this show i think we we have some internal conflict when we're discussing what to cover when sure, it Sam has, and i argue all the time yeah mm -hmm. when it especially when it has to do with things that are at the edges yeah and to right. me those are the important things the most some of the most important things an example would be like uh, you know uh pop music like that tom is, york this week yeah, yeah, pop right. music that is becoming art music, you know. Bjork is, as an example, she's a, quote, pop musician, but, you know, her stuff isn't played on the radio anymore, the new stuff, and it's certainly not trying to be a three-and-a-half-minute pop song anymore. So what do you do with that music, and do we cover it? Um, and to me, that's a very interesting thing. And, and And Dave and I go back and forth about this and, like, I'll suggest we cover such and such, and he'll say no, and I'll say well, we covered Bjork, so why can't we do this? And that's true. I should <laughs> never let us do Bjork. <laughs> You're setting yeah, precedents. You're setting precedents. I know. Right, right. That's, that's where the problem started. <laughs> yeah, but so what do we do about that? Because I think she's definitely creating art music. You yeah, know, and she was a pick of the week for us. That's right. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's not, people that that consider themselves members of bands. And they make music as a band are creating some fine art music. And, and to me, that's one of the most interesting things we've covered is wh what to do with those kinds of people. And well, you know, we have, where do they so go ahead? Go ahead. I was going to say, we, we also have this, this growing trend of contemporary chamber music that acts like pop music, where there's a group of composers slash performers that write music kind of together and mm -hmm. uh, create albums together where the album is as much 
the 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 end result of their collaboration as a documented score we we talk about groups like you know Y music and um ice and uh I'm trying to think there's some others that are kind of in that family of Newspeak? go ahead News Newspeak Newspeak yeah. exactly that's the one I was trying to come up with um that I might that, say Victoire too yeah Victoire right. that are composers and performers all working together in the in much the same way that um that that bands do and it really makes it even harder to draw the line uh, between th that and what Bjork is doing. And yes. that's, I think, like Sam said, a really interesting space. And we've been trying to get a show off the ground about that space for a long time. <laughs> oh, right. Bill Band. Not, Bill not Band, only, yeah. I mean, not only is this an interesting space, but uh, it's also where we can potentially reach more people. I yes. think, you know, like this is, it, it's the border and it's, it's confusing for the media, but we use Sound Notion, Accurate Fulis and Sequenza and Music Box. We're flexible enough to decide to cover or not this, to go this way or not. And by, by, by shedding some light on these fringe, you know, phenomenon that we see and those frictions between classical and rock and pop, this is where we can meet new audiences, I think. So, yes. Uh, That's so exactly, somebody in chat just said almost exactly that same thing. Uh, this comment is, I, I think that covering Bjork is something that might help bring other people uh, to the, the bigger or smaller world of new music. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's a, a point well taken, that that is, in, in a lot of ways, the bridge between popular music and the considerably less popular music that, that we usually talk about on the show. I think there's a... Go ahead. Sorry, Go ahead Tom. I just wanted to say that it doesn't really take much to get into a new kind of music, and especially classical music. I don't know what your individual experiences have been, but I remember as a teenager, I was playing guitar, I was 14, I was teaching myself guitar, and I was into heavy metal, black metal, death metal, these kind of things, and with this weird romantic attraction to classical music and, you know, Baroque music. Mm -hmm. And I got into Baroque music through that, because some bands were using some weird arrangements or weird harmonies that didn't really sound heavy metal. I was like, why are they, how did they get those kind of harmonies? And you just realize that it's just ripped off Bach or ripped off Vivaldi. Counterpoint, or like yeah. That. No, like just, oh, it's 16th century counterpoint. And just get, you know, and the door is open. You can step, if you're curious enough, there you go, you're already into Baroque music. It doesn't take much. So if we can open this door through pop music or rock music, let's do it. Why yes. not? Absolutely. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. there are a lot of a lot of people who are fans of weird music, for lack of a better term, that is like, you know, something from more of a pop music domain that has gotten more towards weird art music that would like weird art music that started as <laughs> classical music. It is the classical music weird art music. They just don't realize it yet. And... You know, that's the perfect way to get them, get them into that. So get them while they're young. We so, need to form, yeah, we form need, a relationship with Pitchfork or something. Yeah, well, I was just thinking what we really need to do is uh, start talking about this magazine thing. We've been talking to, so <laughs> generally about this blog this whole time. We're going to run totally out of time for the magazine. And not to mention, I don't know if we mentioned this, but... Thomas is also a composer. Right. Composer. <laughs> <laughs> but he can find the time. Right, exactly. We, 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 we can all relate to that, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell us about how the, where this magazine came from. There's just the one issue that's out right now, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, the first issue came on uh, June 18th, so a little bit more than a month ago. Uh, the, the magazine was something that I had in the back of my head, but the, the goal for 2000. Uh, 13 and beginning of 2014 was to actually completely redesign the blog and work with a team of web developers, WordPress developers, graphic designers, and maybe reach out and you know put a small Kickstarter out there, try to get some funding. But the goal was to just change the website because because I'm, I'm struggling with the limitations of the theme and it doesn't really reflect the, the way we work, the, 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 the workflow. Or, anyway, that, that was not really a priority for me. The magazine was not a priority. But back in February, a friend of mine invited me to app.net which is a social network um, that you have to pay for. There is no advertising. Uh, and it's mostly for developers, programmers, designers. Uh, so I, I just you know, looked at it and started talking to people. It's, it's, it's a very, very friendly uh, network where jumping in a conversation is absolutely OK. You can, you can do it and learn so much. So, um, so just by reaching out to people and talking, after 45 minutes, I was in touch with the, the co-founder of Type Engine. 
which is this new platform that is revolutionizing the, the newsstand um, magazines on, on iOS devices. Um, you, you might know that Apple released the, the newsstand uh, something like a year and a half ago, but there was no platform to bring content to uh, the newsstands. So what happened was that the large media companies or companies uh, that could afford to have developers work on apps and things like that were basically pushing their content. And most of the content was really just um, a PDF export of InDesign magazines. If you look at what Condé Nast is doing, most of the time that's what it is. It's a huge PDF file, a huge clever PDF file that takes about you know like 15 minutes or more to download. That's very slow. You have to pinch and zoom. It's kind of weird. So Type Engine decided to go the opposite way. And um, so they were looking at the time for launch partners. I applied, and I was the, the only one talking about music, I think. So they were interested in the profile. And so I got selected as a launch partner. Following this, there were a month of you know working hand in hand and designing templates and tweaking the app and finding the right content and shooting videos. So, so eventually, uh, June 18th, we decided to launch, and we're available in the in the Apple newsstand. So, if you own an iPad, an iPhone, or an iPod Touch, you can um, download the app in the Apple newsstand. The app is free, uh, just like most of the apps in the Apple newsstand. But then the content is on a subscription basis. And uh, right now, we're a, we're a bi-monthly magazine, uh, and we go for 2.99 US dollars an, an issue. Nice. Excellent. A price a price you can't beat, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, going cheaper would be, I mean, I'm not even sure that it's sustainable at this price, but I think we can make it if we reach a nice critical mass of subscribers. But, uh, you know, Apple takes a cut, of course, Type Engine, which is a service provider, takes a share also. Uh, and and the, the goal for me is to be able to pay the writers as much as possible and yeah. uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But it's a very, very exciting experience. Um, I, I'm getting a lot of downloads from countries that I don't necessarily um, get, get traffic from on, on the website. Uh, mm. like China, for some reason, is subscribes a lot com comparatively. Interesting. So, so, so that's 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 interesting. And and also, we're the first and only uh, Apple Newsstand magazine to talk about contemporary and classical music. You can. You can get Classica, you can get some other ones, probably the BBC or something, uh, Limelight might have also an app, but we're the only ones focus, focusing exclusively on contemporary classical music, so Great. we just have to keep on working and you know spreading the world and, and getting people to be featured. Well, uh, I don't have any iOS devices, but I was able to steal one from a friend long enough to uh, check out the magazine, and first of all, it looks beautiful. It, it it works very smoothly and it looks beautiful and the content is is excellent um and and i would imagine now that trying to be the editor of the blog as well as the editor of the magazine can uh bring up some interesting editorial decisions for you when you have to put a piece of content in one or the other Right? Do you, or, or is there a lot of crossover between the two? I, I saw that you had posted an excerpt from an article in the magazine to the blog th this week or last week, um, but I didn't notice a lot of articles that I saw in the magazine uh, show up in the blog. And, and it's, it's correct. Uh, the, the only thing that I did was, for instance, two interviews. The, the, the interview format on iCare, if you listen, is five questions. You know, it's short, it's straight to the point, it's perfect for the blog format. So the only thing that I did is that for two artists that we interviewed, uh, namely Dan Visconti and uh, Clint Mansell, we ran longer interviews and we just posted the short interview on the blog and the long interview in the magazine, which is something that I tried. I'm not sure that I want to do it in the future because I really want the content in the magazine to be exclusive. So, um, yeah. so, that, so that's the thing. And, and uh, apart from those two pieces, the rest is really exclusive. What I will do, though, is post some excerpts on the blog of course, to you know, raise awareness of the magazine, try to bring people uh, into the newsstand, and you know, give it a shot. So, especially because I think we're really proud of the content we have in the magazine. So we want to showcase this through the blog too. But otherwise, there are going to be two separate channels with an opportunity for writers to get into longer form pieces. Uh, I've got some very strict uh, guidelines on the blog in terms of word count, and uh, and I'm more than happy to just you know wave them for the for the magazine as long as the story is nicely covered so uh so we're going to focus into longer form articles 
And, uh, and also it's a great way to differentiate what kind of things we're doing. The blog is becoming more of, um, of a daily beat kind of, kind of outlet where you'll read about the cities that just came out, you know, the articles, possibly some opinion posts. I will probably keep on posting some um, French names, French composers' names in MP3s, mm -hmm. uh, which is a fun feature. And, uh, and the concept, the daily concerts in New York City. The, the magazine, though, will try to focus on larger issues. And uh, I started assigning pieces, which is something that I don't normally do on the magazine, on the blog. Uh, we're basically all volunteers on I Care If You Listen. The only person that's, that's getting uh, paid for his work is the, the operations coordinator of Sam Rising. Uh, but otherwise, we're all volunteers. So, uh, you know, working with volunteers, I, I don't feel comfortable assigning pieces. Uh, but on the magazine, I started assigning pieces to cover some in-depth articles and focus on certain ensembles in a very certain way, or, you know, I work very closely with uh, Dana Wen, who's the tech editor, so we talk about possible tech features in the magazine, so it's, it's a very different kind of work. It's, I think it's complementary. Uh, I think for, for the readership, it's great to just go on the website and get some, you know, some quick reviews about cities and concerts for free, and then if you want something you can read on the go, uh, I see lots of people in New York City commuting with their tablets, just sitting down on the train and reading something and maybe in bed or something away from your computer, that's a great way to do it with the magazine. But, uh, but I really see them as, as complementary. And, um, and the editorial choices are not that really hard to make. So, yeah. so, far, so far it's good, yeah. What kind of uh, rich media is available in the, in the magazine? In the magazine so far, we offer uh, exclusive videos. Uh, the only thing with the video is that we're trying to keep the, the issues extremely light, so there should be you should be able to download an issue within like two or three minutes, very very fast. So the the video is not embedded. It's, I mean, it's not the file is not embedded. So it's a video embed, and you ha you're gonna have to be connected to a Wi-Fi connection or 4G connection to stream the video. Otherwise, the issues themselves come with photo text, of course, but also MP3. And I'm talking more and more with record labels uh, to see if they're okay to give us some MP3s we can embed in the magazine. Um, it's, it's actually very, very safe for the labels because once an, an MP3 is embedded in an article, the only thing that a reader can do is listen to it. There is no way to download it, rip it, send it to somebody else. It's in the article and in the article only in this closed, secure shell that the app is. So I think that's a, that's a strong signal that I can send to the record labels. And so far, the feedback has been very good. People are interested in giving MP3s. And, uh, you know, and that's, that, that makes for a great experience when you're listening to an interview and playing music in the background on the same article on your iPad. It's, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, that's really great. And it's something that I think um, is, is a really unique way. Well, not, maybe not unique is not the right word, but it's a, it's a great way to take advantage of uh, the, the platform that you're on. You know, it's not a print magazine and it can have those great things. And it's something that traditional print publications have been really slow to pick up on that that there are all these possibilities because it's a lot of work they're already doing all that stuff for their all, all their print layouts and everything for the the paper magazine and they don't want to do it again and have all the media stuff on top of it in the digital version i have a a, a digital subscription to the new yorker that drives me crazy on a regular basis um and I, I just wish that they would give up on the paper thing and spend all their time making the digital one amazing. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and something that, that Thomas, you and I talked about in an email conversation uh, is that, that uh, I can't access your, your magazine on a regular basis because I don't have any iOS devices. Is, are there any other ways that people can, can get this content for now? Uh, is there any kind of like web portal or can, can I view it in iTunes? on a Mac or something? No, no, you, you cannot view it on iTunes. You, it's, it's specifically for iOS devices. Okay. Uh, some other type engine partners have um, a web platform where you can read some articles or download some articles. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we can go that way. I need to look into this, but I'm not sure. I think I'd rather you know, keep on pushing the app and, and, and you know, tweaking the content and the workflow. Uh, and as soon as Type Engine is ready to implement um, the app for um, Android devices, then we'll have a great product. Um, but as of today, unfortunately, it's, you know, and I'm not trying to limit the readership, but as of today, it's on the iOS devices. And, and as you know, Dave, we, we talked about it in, in the email conversation, but uh, 
it's due mostly to the, the fragmentation on the, on the on the Android market. Yeah. So um, creating an app, creating an app uh, that looks great on an HTC, a Samsung, and other brands with different sizes of screens, uh, different um, uh, OS uh, versions. The problem, the problem yeah. with Android is that some people uh, run OSs that are two or three years old. Right. Well, and I, I bring it up just to say that it's it's absolutely not something that you have a ton of control over, and and I, I just completely understand a, a startup like Type Engine only has so many engineers that they can put toward the the problems that they're facing, and they can if they if they can limit the number of problems they're facing by only focusing on one platform, that's that's totally fine for these these startup companies. That's, that's how it has to work. You know, when 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 Facebook launches an app, it's very easy for them to throw engineers at all the problems. Yeah. But for a small company, they only have so many resources. So we we totally understand. But as you as you noticed, uh, the, the 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 app is is very simple and very slick, very fast. Yes. It's, resp it's responsive. It's basically HTML5. There's some CSS. Three, some JSON, so so it's it, it's not that that code heavy in a very Apple Apple specific way. I right. think it it would be easy, relatively easy, to transfer this into a, a, an Android platform. So um, so the fact that it's fast, sleek, and responsive is actually a great asset to transfer to uh, the Android market. Yeah, I think I think it's great, and I, I can't can't wait for that to happen. And until then, I, I will just have to uh, steal my friend's iPad whenever I can. <laughs> so Tim, I'm going to steal your iPad more. Subscribe all your friends. Right there, you go. <laughs> I'll just buy it on his on his iTunes. Even better, even better. <laughs> Best of both worlds, right? I get it, and somebody else pays for it. There you go. Um, so Perfect. let's uh, let's move on to to talk about uh, your music, Thomas. You've got uh, you meant we're going to talk about a solo piano piece of years later, but you mentioned that you have uh, an opera project that is just getting off the ground. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just got commissioned to write my my second opera by uh, Underworld Productions Opera, which is run by Gina Krusko here in New York City. Um, I'm going to be composer in residence with them throughout the season. Um, I'm extremely excited. Uh, Gina is a wonderful person, is a wonderful artist, and she's got a great ear. And a great view in terms of opera. Uh, so we, we we met, of course, a lot of times, and uh, I pitched a couple of ideas. She picked one. So I'm in the process of finding a librettist. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea of the story itself, but uh, I really want to work with a librettist, especially because it's uh, it's an ad adaptation of a 19th century French novel. So there is a textual source that we can work on. Uh, so th this is this is the, the very beginning stages. I'm still looking for uh, for librettists. I've got some strong profiles that I need to contact, see if they're interested. Um, do you, you want to know a little bit more about the story? Or uh... absolutely, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the 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 opera is going to be based on a French novel from the late 19th century called The Mariage de Loti, Loti's Wedding, which is actually the novel that was the basis of uh, Lacme by Delib. And also *Lille du Rêve* by by Renaldo Han. So, so the interesting thing is that the, the the novel initially takes place. I mean, the novel takes place in Tahiti, but uh, Lacme and uh, the Delib and, and his librettist uh, just transfer the story to the the Indian Raj. Uh, but initially, the the novel takes place in Tahiti, and I happen to have grown up in Tahiti, so I'm I, I still I'm still very very much attached to the to the culture and uh, the stories over there. Uh, and reading this novel, I was kind of shocked because it's very um, misogynistic and also colonial, uh, which doesn't mean that the author himself was a terrible person, but it's a product of its time. The 19th century, as we know, was very colonial and, you know, the view on women and indigenous people was not the best. So I reacted very strongly and I decided to rewrite this from a, a post-colonial and a feministic point of view, giving a stronger voice to the, to the main female character. The story is pretty much a butterfly story with a sailor that comes and you know gets married to this young girl and decides to go back to his country, regardless of the relationship he has and the impact that it, that this can have on on the life of his wife. So, uh, hmm. so that that's basically going to be it. And um, the premiere is going to be in Symph at Symphony Space in May 2014. That's really great. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so you you've worked on on operas before. How is this project going to be different from your your, your previous opera? The, the previous opera, I I wrote the libretto 
uh, I staged it, I designed the set. I mean, I you know had people to help me, of course, but uh, it was just it was a much much smaller product, and uh, and I was covering a lot of grants and doing lots of things myself. Uh, this time, uh, I just have to work with the librettist, give the scores, uh, give the parts. I'll be there for the for the auditions. I'll be coaching the singers. Uh, I hope to work hand in hand with Gina Crusco and the set designer to, to bring some ideas. But uh, but it's 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 much 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 easier for me. I mean, I, I'm I'm lucky to be working with a production company that's going to take care of the costs. Um, that's going to put it on stage um, in, a, in a great space. So this is a very very different. Um, way to work, of course. I mean, I feel extremely lucky to, to, to be doing this. Uh, in terms of writing, it's a much larger piece. It's about 40, 45 minutes. So considering all the things that I'm doing, apart from composing, I'm going to have to resume a very, very strict uh, writing schedule. So uh, I, will write, I will try to write a lot and sleep even less. <laughs> Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so should sure. we... Sam? Were you yes. Say? I wasn't saying anything, but right, I was right. going to agree that we should jump to the news. Yeah, we're running really, really long, so we'll, let's let's get into the news. Sam, speaking of Bjork, you had you had a Bjork-related news item, I think. Yeah, I just stuffed this in there because I had forgotten that I'd seen it, and talking about <laughs> making stuff for Android reminded me of it. Uh, a former pick of the week, uh, Bjork's Biophilia, I guess is how you say it, um, was available. In, you know, it's sort of an interactive app. Uh, thing. I mean, if you don't know what it is, you should go try it to understand, but it's now available on the Android platform, finally, after like a year and a half. So that's good. So grab it. So grab yeah. it. Um, also, you know, there's a Radiohead-related story, so you knew that I was so going to talk about that one. of course we have to cover that <laughs> one, right? <laughs> right. Um, Tom York and his uh, partner in the band Adams for Peace... Um, have pulled all of their content. This Tom, not so if you're wondering how this is related to Radiohead and you don't know, Tom York is the front man for Radiohead. Right. right. Um, they have both pulled their, their content from Spotify. Um, and, you know, Tom York is no uh, stranger to kind of like uh, shaking up the, the music business. Um, you know, Radiohead released an album where you could pay for it or not pay for it, and it was uh, available for download. Um and the, the, what's interesting to me about this is that there's a lot of different opinions. You know, you talk to 13 different people, you'll get 13 different opinions. But their uh, reasoning for removing their content from Spotify is that it doesn't do anything to support new artists. Um, if you're a juggernaut and you're going to get millions and millions and millions of plays, you're going to make some money. Um, but if you're, you get 10,000 plays, which seems like a lot... Um, you're barely going to get anything. But then the other side of the coin is people say it's a great mode for discovery. You know, a new artist puts their stuff out there and people find them and that'll lead them to buy their content. Um, I don't think we have any hard uh, facts on that, but we, it seems like we cover something going to track. on. Yeah, it seems like we cover something going on with Spotify at least every couple of months or so. And it's usually um, it's usually to do with artists not getting paid as much as they think they should be paid. And that's a little bit of a weird thing for us to cover because we cover an, a genre of music which is almost completely unprofitable. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> and we don't and, uh, make money either. So right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, They've pulled their content from uh, Spotify, and you know they're not the first people to do this. S St Holdings, which is a company in the UK that has uh, lots of like dubstep and techno, and Fortet is on that label. Um, nice. They pulled like 200 different artists um, off of Spotify uh, like a year, <laughs> more than a year ago. So anyway, the Spotify saga continues. Um, we're also going to have a link to. Uh, the artist services uh, Spotify page where they give their rundown of how artists are paid and why they think their model is good for everyone. And uh, we report, you decide. <laughs> right. <laughs> well put. Do, 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 do. Right. Really Need quick some... news. Also, we had reported, uh, we had uh, reported, um, I'm not sure how long ago we covered it, but uh, there was going to be... I don't know this how to pronounce this guy's name. Thomas should take this for us. P e r e i r a. Pereira, I think. Pereira. 
Well, anyway, the guy, Alexander Pereira was going to take over as the general manager of La Scala, and he is taking that position a year early. Um, they don't really get into exactly why, um, but that's happening. Um, also, the Emerson String Quartet, which was established in 1976, is having their first um, personnel mix-up personnel mix up since 1979. Um, Paul Watkins is replacing David Finkel, who joined the group in 1979, so right after they formed. Uh, so the Emerson String Quartet... Paul Watkins Quartet. is great, too. He's a, he's a cellist of the Nash Ensemble and was conductor yeah. of the English Chamber Orchestra, and... Um, He's a great fit for that quartet. Um, yeah, I, I doubt he would have gotten the gig if he weren't pretty great. Oh, yeah. Well, David, so David is becoming um, more and more busy these days as uh, he so and his, and, and, yeah, and as wife Wuhan um, are both artistic directors of Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center. Um, and they're traveling, and it's, it's I, I, you know, I'm, I think David has become super busy with his own, his own projects, and he said so as much um you know in the press and um i think it's great that you know the quartet can live on especially with with paul who's a great well, great great performer being in that position and having to quit the emerson string quartet because you're too busy doing other cooler stuff is a good place to be in life i think <laughs> I, I, um, I think i can agree with that not yeah, not yeah. a lot of people can say that yeah and we're not going to talk about it this week because we're going long, but friend of the show, Rob Deemer, has a great uh, blog this week on New Music Box called Cable Comparisons, comparing the cable industry and how it's evolved to the, not really the new music business, but the see, new orchestral music business, let's say, and you should check it out, but we're right. not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about that TV stuff, because that's yeah. TV stuff. Though you should totally <laughs> check out House of Cards because it got nine Emmy nominations this week. That's it's right. on Netflix. <laughs> so that's we're not going to talk about it though. But you should watch it because we're not going to. You can talk catch about that it. on our other blog, uh, which is I don't know soundnotion.tv <laughs> slash stuff we don't talk about on Sound Notion. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to do it for. Uh, well, we got to well, we got to listen to our show. I almost blew through the pick of the week. It's pick of the week time. Thomas the pick has of the week. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I couldn't see that you were preparing it. Normally, I can look and see that you were getting ready, but we're having technical difficulties and not getting video from Sam. Um, our pick of the week this week is a, a piece by our guest, Thomas De DeNoville, uh, a solo piano piece. Thomas, do you want to uh, give us a little bit of uh, an introduction to this before we play it? Yes, it's, uh, it's a piece that I performed a few years ago, a pro kind of that I composed a few years ago called Phototactic. Uh, the idea of phototactic is based on the phototaxis. Phototaxis is the movement of an organism um, responding, uh, re responding, responding uh, to light, basically. So if the taxis is positive, the organism will move closer to the light, or negative will move away from the light. So, so this, this is the idea that I try to develop in, 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 that, in that piece. And, um, but I also saw it as some kind of spiritual path. And Anyway, so that's, that's what I try to do. Um, is this you performing? No, it's not. The performer is Ben Laudy. Okay. Wonderful pianist. All Wonderful. right. Great. Well, so here is an excerpt from Phototactic by our guest, Thomas DeNeville. Thank 
So that was an excerpt from Phototactic by our guest, Thomas DeNivo. Thomas, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's a, a, a really, you have these really clear sections at the beginning that are so distinct. And then right w when I stopped the excerpt, we were transitioning into a new section that was really closely, uh, almost just like a stretched out version of the one that we were going to get to. And we, we were just getting into some of the, uh, the uh, polyrhythms that are in there. So it's a really interesting piece that has uh, a lot of uh, uh, contrast in such a relatively short space. So yeah, thank you for was, sharing that with us. I was, I was playing with the idea of having an apex that is not what you would expect. So mm -hmm. anyway. <laughs> the so, rest is on my website or SoundCloud. Yeah, you should. We'll have a link to where you can listen to that whole thing, and you you should because it 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 starts to get into some very different things uh, shortly after that. It's something that I I, I wasn't sure exactly what section to play because we we don't usually play the the whole piece, but there's such stark contrast within this you know f was it five six minute piece um, that's uh, hard to pick one couple minute thing to to play out of it. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. It was normally we'd talk about it a little bit more, but we're we're already about, about an hour and fifteen in. Um, so, uh, thank you for sticking around and and bearing with our our technical difficulties. It was great to have you on the show this week, Thomas. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so so much, guys, and thank you for what you're doing for the new music community. It's, it's awesome. Hey, likewise, we're yeah. big fans of everything you do, and everyone should definitely check out. Uh, I care if you listen dot com. Follow them on Twitter and and all of those other things. Uh, do you have anything big coming up that you want to tell us about? Any big big features for for either the blog or the magazine? Issue two is gonna be great. That's all I can say. All and, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the summer summer mixtape is going really really well. So if you don't have anything to listen this summer, just come to the website and you can get some MP3s for free with some great stuff. Absolutely. There's some great stuff. The the mixtapes that you do with I Care If You Listen have some fantastic music. If you guys are not checking out the, the mixtapes at I Care If You Listen, you are missing out on some really great music that's totally free. Um and and it's it's worth worth every non penny that you spend on it. <laughs> I would just like to add that it's free because some wonderful artists are generous enough to give us an MP three. So you know And I then you should go buy it. There you go. That's the point. You know, it's free because some wonderful artists decided to give us some some MP3s for you guys. But uh, in return, I think we should go and support them because they're doing some great work. Right. And so if you find something there that you like, go find the whole album and buy it. Buy it maybe for a friend too, and then three of your other friends. <laughs> um, so now for real, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us this week, for everyone that was watching live. We had a lively discussion going on in chat this week, and we really appreciate everyone doing that. You at home, if you're watching this or listening to my voice after the fact, if you're listening to the recording, you can join us live. We do the show live every morning. Or every morning. <laughs> well, that would never happen. <laughs> uh, we, do, <laughs> we do the show live every week on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can translate that to whatever time zone <coughs> in the world you find yourself in. Uh, at soundnotion.tv slash live, and you can join us in chat. If you've got a free Ustream account, we can figure out who you are, but you don't have to have a free Ustream account. You can just be identified by Ustream streamer and a big strong number uh yeah, and number three seven zero zero six eight today right <laughs> so there you go uh but we uh had a had a great conversation going on in chat about all kinds of things related to the show and not related to the show good people thank you to everyone who joined us in chat and we encourage anyone else to join us live in chat in in the future um again Next 11 a.m sunday what do you got sam Next week, uh, we have the uh, incredible bass clarinet duo oh, yes. uh, Squonk for the show. The live stream will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Patrick, Nate, <laughs> and Dave. <laughs> That's right. Okay. We, I forgot to mention that. We do have a time change for next week. We're at 4 p.m. Yes. Eastern time uh, to, to account for everyone's schedules. So normally we are at 11 a.m. Eastern time, but next week we're at 4. Um, so you should definitely show up for that because Squonk... Uh, kicks ass. Yes, they, they kick lots of ass, and and we'll be asking <laughs> them about how much ass they kick live on the internet next week. Um, you, if you have any uh, questions about anything we talked about, or if you have any comments on anything we talked about, we've been sharing 
our thoughts on everything for the last uh, hour or so. But if you would like to contribute to that conversation, it should not end when I hit the stop record button. Uh, it should continue on afterwards. You can share your thoughts on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, where you can also find links to all Thomas's stuff and all the things that we mentioned in the news bit at the end. Um, and you can also connect with us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, like I care if you listen on Facebook, follow us on uh, YouTube or subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter. If you'd like to suggest a story for the show, you can do that on our site or you can tweet with hashtag SN Weekly. Uh, and we always look at that hashtag when we're putting the show together each week. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store. So please be sure to do that. If you'd like to support the show, you can use our Amazon search affiliate box on our site. Um, whenever you're buying whatever it is you're buying on on uh, on Amazon, just search for it in there and we'll get a little commission. It doesn't cost you anything or look any different to you after that, but it helps us out a lot and we really appreciate it. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week at 4 p.m. Eastern Time with Squonk. Craft beer. Mmm.